Hello and welcome to the Ottoman History Podcast. This is episode 4, The Battle of Pelakanon. We left off the previous episode in 1324 with the death of Osman Ghazi. Meanwhile, the siege of Persia had been ongoing for seven years at this point. The question of succession made or broke the great empires of mankind. The legacies of many conquerors perished in the dusty pages of history right after their deaths. Meanwhile, those that managed to preserve and transfer the power from one generation to another peacefully went on to build great empires with lasting legacies. The Ottoman state at this point did not have clear succession laws, thus the question of succession became very relevant when Osman died. Despite lack of clear laws, there was one major rule every Turkish nomad abided by. Only the greatest warrior deserved to be the ruler. This was the rule of the steppe. Osman had six sons, as far as we know. However, we do not know much about them. The eldest was likely Orhan, who was in his early 40s when Osman died. Alaaddin was around the same age as Orhan. Some historians claim that he was younger than Orhan, meanwhile others claim that he was the eldest. There were four others, but we do not know much about them, though they do not appear to have any significance to Ottoman politics. Of the two politically significant brothers, Orhan and Alaaddin, it was very clear who the true successor was. Orhan had led several campaigns at this point, especially after Osman's sickness, and was seen as the clear successor by the Ottoman warriors. There are three versions of the consequent events. Byzantine historian Leonikos Halconideles claims that Orhan mustered an army, marched on Söğüt, and murdered his brothers, thus seizing the throne. It is possible this happened. However, Halconadiles does not bring up any of his sources to back this claim up. The second version is told by the 18th century Ottoman historian Mehmet Rashid, who claims that Orhan was crowned with overwhelming popular support, and after failing to gain supporters to back his claim to the throne, the other brother, Alaaddin, retired from politics and lived peacefully until his death. The last version comes from 15th century Ottoman historian Ashik Pashazade. In this version, Orhan offers Alaaddin the crown, but Alaaddin, knowing that Orhan is the superior general, turns down this offer, graciously leaving the throne to his more capable brother. Following this, Orhan was crowned, and Alaaddin became an administrative advisor to Orhan and oversaw the bureaucratic and military reforms during Orhan's reign. Some records mention Alaaddin as a commander in the Battle of Pelakenon later on, so it is almost certain that Alaaddin was not killed by Orhan and enjoyed a high position in his brother's court. I believe it is likely that Alaaddin saw that he did not have enough support to claim the throne and instead chose to serve his brother. Thus, Orhan was crowned without any issues nor civil wars, which was crucial for the survival of the Ottoman state, and attacks on Byzantine territory was immediately continued. Orhan's commander, Abdul Rahman, attacked Samandre, which is only 20 kilometers away from Constantinople, and is even a part of modern city of Istanbul. Abdul Rahman's men attacked and captured the ruler of the town while he was outside the walls for the funeral of his deceased son. Semendre surrendered soon after the capture of its ruler. A few kilometers south of Semendre lay the fortress of Eidos, which was a formidable stone fortress built on top of a hill. However, an Ottoman spy opened the castle's gates to the Ottoman troops at night and the castle was swiftly captured without many casualties. With the capture of Eidos, the Ottomans were cutting off the land road from Constantinople to Nicomedia 
and Nicaea. On the southern front, in 1326, Orhan mustered all his men and marched on Prussia to oversee the siege personally. At this point, the city was under siege for nine long years. Not only the countryside around Prusa was completely overran, but also every town and fortress within a hundred kilometer radius was taken by the Ottomans. Population of Prusa was starving and cut off from all outside trade, and it was clear that no help was coming from Constantinople. Prusa was ready to capitulate. In front of the walls of the city, the commander of Bursa and Orhan negotiated Bursa's surrender. According to their deal, Bursa would be spared and Ottomans would not pillage the city nor enslave its population. In return, the city would pay 30,000 gold as tribute. It was agreed that those that wanted to leave would be able to leave and those that wanted to remain would be considered Ottoman subjects. Thus, one of the greatest Byzantine cities in Anatolia was captured by the Ottomans in 1326 after a nine year long siege. Orhan moved his court to Bursa after this conquest as well as the body of his father Osman. The chapel of Hagia Elia was converted to a tomb and Orhan had his father buried within the former chapel. Bursa would be the first major Ottoman city, though it would not be the last. Two years later, in 1328, Orhan marched on Nicaea this time and besieged it. Nicaea was a politically, economically and religiously significant city. It once served as the capital of the empire during the Latin occupation of Constantinople. It was a rich city that sat on the trade roads that connected Asia to Europe and was a major silk production hub. On top of those, Nicaea was home to many Christian holy sites. Arguably, Nicaea was the wealthiest and the most important Byzantine city after Constantinople herself. However, once again, the Byzantines were too preoccupied with their internal affairs to oppose Ottoman advances. Since 1321, Andronikos II was fighting a civil war against his grandson Andronikos III. This civil war lasted until 1328 and resulted in Andronikos III deposing his grandfather and being crowned as the emperor. Andronikos III was much more energetic and competent than his grandfather. After being crowned as the emperor in 1328, he started mustering an army to relieve Nicaea. As his armies mustered, Andronikos made an alliance with the Karasid Turks against Ottomans. Karasids were the Ottoman neighbors to the west and were increasingly worried about the Ottoman expansions around Bursa. However, the emperor would receive no real help from the Karasids despite this diplomatic maneuver. By 1329, Andronikos had only managed to gather an army of 6,000 in Sukutari, the Asian side of Constantinople. This number was a massive downgrade from the army Michael Palaiologos led in Magnesia. However, this is very understandable considering what the empire went through in the last two decades. On top of Michael's failed expeditions, Catalan company ravaged the empire. Meanwhile, Ottoman attacks in Anatolia prevented the empire from collecting tax revenue from their Anatolian holdings. On top of that, Andronikos III fought a seven year long civil war with his grandfather. So by 1329, the best Andronikos III could muster was 6,000 men. Meanwhile, Orhan's scouts were constantly updating him on the whereabouts of the Byzantine army. This was particularly easy as the Ottomans at this point held almost all fortresses and towns between Sukutari and Nicaea. Upon hearing that the Byzantine army left Sukutari, 
and was marching eastwards towards Nicomedia, Orhan left the siege of Nicaea and swiftly rode west with 8,000 men. He took a defensive position on the hills of Pelacanon, which lay between the Byzantine army led by Emperor Andronicus and Nicaea. On June 10, 1329, two armies met each other in this field of Pelacanon. This would be the first showdown between a Byzantine emperor and an Ottoman sultan. Unfortunately for Andronicus, the conditions did not favor the Byzantines. His army was outnumbered and he was facing an enemy that had strong defensive positions on hilltops. Though his army appears to have been better armed and more disciplined than the rebel his father Michael led in the previous decades. Seeing that the odds were stacked against him, Andronicus refused to attack the Ottomans in their defensive positions. The Byzantine commanders wanted to wait in the open field and draw Orhan's forces there. If the Ottomans did not wish to fight them in the open, Andronicus simply planned to retreat. Meanwhile, Orhan's plan was to draw the Byzantines to hills and ambush them there. On the first day of the battle, it quickly became clear to Orhan that the Byzantines were unwilling to fall for his trap. In response, Orhan sent 300 horse archers to harass and bait the Byzantine army into chasing them to the hills. Though the Byzantines were experienced at Turkish battle tactics after fighting for almost 300 years against them. They did not fall for feigned retreat tactics and held their ground. The next day, Orhan's cavalry once again started harassing the Byzantines. Andronicus responded by leading a contingent of cavalry and intercepted the Ottoman horse archers. Seeing this, Orhan sent reinforcements to relieve his horse archers. Thus, the small skirmish escalated into a full-fledged battle between the two armies. Seemingly, Andronicus got what he wanted here. Orhan was being forced to fight him in the open field. Unfortunately for Andronicus, that was the end of his good fortunes. As soon as the battle began, he was hit by an arrow and wounded. The wound was not serious. However, seeing this, the Byzantine soldiers thought that the emperor was killed and started panicking. This quickly turned into a full rout, and once again, the Byzantine army fled before the Ottomans without putting up much resistance. Many were slain, though Andronicus managed to flee, first to the safety of Nicomedia and then to Constantinople. After this victory, Orhan's fame among the Turks grew considerably. With the conquest of Prusa and the victory at Palakinon, the defenders of Nicaea were heavily demoralized. Though the city resisted for two more years, only falling in 1331. Ottomans converted the church in Nicaea to a mosque, built a bathhouse and a public kitchen to serve food to the poor. Ottomans also allowed the Christian city residents to leave the city if they wished, though only a few left, with many preferring to live under Ottoman rule instead. In 1333, Ottomans took Geve and besieged Nicomedia. Nicomedia at this point was the only remaining stronghold Byzantines had in Asia. The city was located some 30 kilometers west of Nicaea and had a port on the Marmara Sea, allowing the city to be supplied by the sea. Hearing of the siege, Emperor Andronikos sailed to the city. Meanwhile, his advisor Contecuzenos marched with a small force following the coast. According to Contecuzenos' writings, his troops managed to drive off the Ottomans. Meanwhile, the emperor entered the city with supplies. These setbacks forced Orhan to seek a better alternative through diplomacy. He probably realized the difficulty of taking this port city without a navy or siege expertise. At the end, Emperor Andronicus agreed to pay a tribute of 2,000 gold yearly to the Ottomans 
and in return, Orhan lifted the siege. Though this siege was significant, as this is the first time we hear of Ottoman siege works. Kante Kuzenos describes that the walls of Nicomedia were bombarded with Ottoman catapults. It is evident that Orhan was not oblivious to the shortcomings of his army and actively worked to overcome these problems. With this tale, Orhan was merely waiting for a better opportunity. Nicomedia would be too difficult to take while the emperor was actively defending it. Orhan knew that the time was on his side. With the collapsing Byzantine power, it was only a matter of time before Andronikos had to leave the area. All Orhan had to do was to wait. And he might have as well made a profit from this wait with this tribute. In 1337, Andronikos left the area to intervene in a civil war in the despotate of Epirus to expand his realm into Albania. This was the opportunity Orhan needed. He mustered his forces and once again marched on Nicomedia. According to Ottoman and Byzantine sources, Nicomedia was being ruled by a princess related to Emperor Andronikos. During the siege, Ottomans managed to capture and kill the governoress's brother, decapitated him and then put his head on a spike in front of the walls of Nicomedia. Seeing her brother's fate, the impossibility of getting reinforcements and the hopelessness of the situation overall, the governoress decided to spare her city and opened the gates to the Ottomans. Thus, the last Byzantine city in Asia had fallen. Ottomans converted the churches in the city to mosques and built an Islamic school. After the conquest of Nicomedia, Orhan found his realm overextended. With the new conquests in Prusa, Nicaea and Nicomedia, Orhan's realm had doubled in size and population. These new Christian lands needed to be governed, protected and taxed. Thus, Orhan launched an administrative reform. He divided his realm between his sons and loyal commanders. His eldest son Suleiman was given Nicomedia, second son Murad Bursa. Meanwhile, he himself ruled from Nicaea as the Great Bey. This shows that Orhan still followed the Central Asian state traditions. The realm was divided between the sons, and the ruler and the ruler ruled as the Great Bey, Sultan Orhan. We famously see this in the Mongol Empire, with a great Khan ruling over the lesser Khans. Though, during the reigns of the next few Ottoman sultans, we will see this nomadic tradition replaced by a more centralized system, with one sultan being the only authority figure, rather than the power being divided between the members of the Osmanolu dynasty. Orhan's reforms did not end with this land distribution. He also minted the first Ottoman coin, known as Akçe, and formed the first infantry regiments of the Ottoman army. Ottoman historian Ashik Pashazade claims that these infantry regiments were the first professional troops of the Ottoman state and were the predecessor to the Janissaries. Ashik Pashazade says that these soldiers were paid a salary in coin and wore uniforms to distinguish themselves from the tribal riders. However, considering that Ashik Pashazade wrote these a century later and does not cite his sources, these claims seem too shaky to be taken at face value. Thus, it is hard to determine if these infantry regiments could be considered as true predecessors to the Janissaries later on, as it is likely that they were much less organized. By the end of 1330s, as Orhan was reforming his realm, the Byzantine Empire was entering a new era, an era of swift decline. With the fall of Nicomedia, the empire was completely kicked out of Anatolia, and the political situation in Europe was not much better. The imperial authority was shaky in Macedonia and Greece, meanwhile the neighboring Serbians and Bulgarians waited for an opportune moment 
to expand into the empire's territories. The only thing that saved the Byzantine collapse in Europe during this time period was the competent leadership of Andronikos III. Although Andronikos could not save Anatolia, he held the Balkans together, thwarting Bulgarian and Serbian invasions, and even expanded the empire into Albania. But most importantly, he held the empire together. Internal strifes and rebellions in provinces were scarce and dealt with swiftly. However, Andronikos would die in 1341, at the young age of 44, throwing the empire once again into a period of chaos and civil war. And this would permanently destroy the fragile status quo the Byzantines maintained since 12th century. To hear more about that, please subscribe and leave a like, and I will see you in the next one to talk about the Byzantine Civil War and Ottoman expansions into Europe. Thank you for listening, and peace be upon you.